Welcome everyone to the Flow Show. This is episode 194. We got the man, the myth, Ben Heath from the UK, superstar. He is going to be talking with us today. This is going to be a very fun day to get to know him better. And he was just on the GG Million commentary as well. So hope you guys got to check that out. And of course, this is brought to you by Club GG, where you can create clubs for free, play with your friends, win hundreds of thousands of dollars in prizes each month. So with that being said, Ben, how are you? Yeah, good. Thanks for having me on. Uh, looking forward to it. It's it's great to have you. And again, we got to talk at the at the GG Million, so got a little bit of um, a little bit little bit of an idea of what's going on in your world. But for those that don't know you, tell us. I always like to say, give us your life summary in a, in a couple of minutes here. How did you get into poker? Where do you come from? And and then I'll, I got a lot of questions. So just give me a brief uh, intro on yourself, please. Um, I'm from Brighton, in the UK. Uh, I got into poker like quite slowly, um, just like playing small games uh, when I was at you know college, university with friends. Started to play a little more during university, during like the end years, but had like a lot of hours that needed for my course at university, so could never do too much. And then, kind of just like straight after university, tried to do that as the first, you know job rather before like going the standard nine to five route I thought I would like try it out now that I had some more hours to put in so yeah did that um and then had I guess three to four years of playing a bunch of stuff like live cash online cash live tournaments online tournaments um until now really like the last four or five years pretty much playing only live tournaments um and a lot smaller schedule yeah, and, and you, Brighton, you mentioned, I know James Dempsey from there. Did you know James growing up? Or I guess you're a little, you're younger. Wait, how old are you? 30, you're 30? 31. 31, okay. So James, yeah, he's a little closer to my age. But you know of him, right? In, in poker, and he's from, I believe, Brighton, and that's who you yeah. support. Is that who you support club-wise? Is that, are you a Brighton fan? Are you big into football or not a not a huge fan? Not, not huge into football. Uh, if, yeah, I guess Brighton would be if I had to. Right. Okay. Fair enough. I know they're doing pretty well. They've had a couple good years here in, in the premiership, but uh, poker more, more interested in, in, in poker, your, your journey, where did you get your first break? I see you played a $10, I believe your first ever hen and mob score. If I'm not mistaken, I saw it was a, a final table is a $10 tournament that didn't know they even, they registered those, but you did get six. Like, do you remember that? Is this, is this actually your first time ever playing live or you played a bit before? So the the fact this isn't actually it's actually not me oh okay all right i've i i messaged years ago like to hendon to say that's not actually me my first one is the one above that okay. uh i've i've actually like never been to newcastle either but uh it's funny that's just always been there that um, is so this is your first time playing live and it was in in san san remo that was my first tournament stop. Yeah, like I'd played live cash in London, um, but that was my first actual tournament stop was San Remo, yeah. And, and what, what did your family friends think about poker? And was it just something that was like a hobby that they didn't really pay much mind to? Or were you like, hey, I'm going to go professional and, and, and please support me? And, and did they? Um, I guess some different opinions. My... A lot of my friends from you know college I kind of played poker with, so they were pretty open to it. Um, my parents were always very supportive of it, but were just a bit kind of I guess looking out for whether I just did it for you know four or five years with no end in sight and no progression. So mm -hmm. after university, I kind of said to them that you know. I'm going to try it for two years and if it's if after two years i'm like making enough per year to cover my own lifestyle and like pay my own way then i'll continue and if not i'll you know go the kind of more traditional route and try and do something with my university degree um so yeah but they were like very supportive within that they just like once i was trying that they were kind of fully supportive of that two years not really very many uh reservations about it and and early on did you were did you ever have uh any 
you know, how, how tough was it for you to break in? I see that you had a pretty good score here early on, right? You got a first place. You're at the, you're in Malta. You know, it's nice to win a tournament and uh, EPT. It's a 1K, but it, it was a decent score. And you had been playing online already. Were you playing a lot online at this time? Yeah, I mean, I, I think at this time I was just playing all the time because I, I was splitting time between playing live cash in London, um, online cash, like was playing Zoom. And then was playing tournaments kind of Saturday and Sundays online and then was traveling to some of these stops. So at the time I was just playing pretty much every day of the week, but mixing formats a lot, which looking back was a lot harder, I think, in terms of now I just focus on, you know, yeah. a specific structure. And it's quite easy to have like progression in that and know what you're aiming for within that structure whereas back then it was just like play like you know online tournaments on sunday and then monday it would just like go down to the vic and play one two live cash so there's a lot of like back and forth and a little harder to know yeah like how good the progression was i guess and and did you at this time were you doing a lot of studying because the solvers weren't really a thing or prevalent at this time early on like what was how are you getting better at poker what what were the ways you were improving your game um yeah i mean the, like i guess they've been around for a while now but i forget you know looking back that just we didn't have these solvers at that point uh they're still a few years out um so a lot of it was uh i was spending a lot of time with charlie carroll who was yep. playing higher stakes than me already um so a lot of it was just like talking hands with him um talking hands with a couple of other people and then just playing all the time i think it was that you know there wasn't this thing these days of looking at your hours playing versus hours studying there was just like play all the time and then when you're not playing talk about the hands think about the hands but uh yeah it, it was a little tougher to have set study time in those days i think yeah and you're you pride yourself now live is it what was a shift for you why did what, what what made you decide to go primarily live than online because online i think during covid was obviously very popular you know that was sort of the, the only option and now you know you have such great results and we're gonna talk about triton and some of the other success that you've had and live but is it just do you prefer the live fully now like what percent are you playing live and online is it literally like 95 5 or 100 0 what is your 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 uh, time um, you pick up with live and online now i think it's very close to 100 zero um well. i play some online sometimes um sometimes just as like a kind of hobby thing like if i'm you know i've played a couple of sessions of zoom over the last few years where i just you know miss that playing online thing of being able to get in a few thousand hands in a session but uh, actual like serious playing mtt's is yeah it's pretty much 100 zero at this point I, I think a lot of it was it got pretty tiring at one point obviously there were just so many live games all the time you could just you know i think there was one point where i could just travel eight months a year just playing tournaments if i wanted so you didn't i didn't really need to play online and then i really just didn't like the schedule in the uk of you know tournaments meant playing till four in the morning often yep and i was just gradually kind of had started liking the schedule of going uh especially you know once we had solvers and this easier to kind of have dedicated study time um you know in a lot of the live stops you actually are playing normal hours and i just kind of graduated towards really liking that just when i was back home in brighton being able to wake up at a reasonable time have like hobbies and see friends yeah and study and then be working properly like really hard hours when i'm traveling um and i think the the grinding got a little tougher to to do that because it's just you're playing till like 4 30 in the morning on sunday and then it just destroys your sleep schedule for the whole week so i think a lot of it was that yeah makes makes a ton of sense was there a breakout moment for you was there a turning point where you were still kind of like ah, i might do this i might not is there a score or a moment that stands out for you in your career where you were maybe having doubts about what you were doing and then you just were were set it, it was clear it was clarity moment where you're like all right this is what i'm going to stick in and do it 
Uh, I, I would actually say no. I, I think that I felt like it was going pretty well at the start um, in terms of, you know, there were a lot of ups and downs with the bankroll and like a few times where I kind of built a small role and then just played higher and took big pieces and lost it. But mm -hmm. progression wise in poker, I felt like I was getting better relatively quickly and felt relatively confident. Um, you know, with tournaments, at least I was felt like I was progressing, but it's hugely swingy. So you can never, it's hard to know whether you can do it or not. But just like progression at cash games that I felt, you know, you can play Zoom and kind of actually earn a steady income yeah uh i felt pretty early quite confident that i would be able to do it in some form if i just like worked very hard at it so i don't think i had the big scores are kind of just these you know huge moments of variance so i don't think i had one was like oh i can definitely do it now it was more it was more just like the steady progression just getting more and more confident that i could do it long term if i wanted to yep yeah i was i was looking back i was kind of scanning through your your hand i do remember this was Back in the day, we played. I think you actually might have. If you, I don't know if this all blends together. Remember, but I, this was a, the really sweet tournament back then. The twenty-five k is one of the biggest ones yeah. where they get one hundred and seventy-three. I think I vaguely remember shoving like ace three of hearts, and I think you had kings. If I'm not mistaken, but that was like one of the first times we got to play, and that was that was cool. It was a big tournament. I think this is one where Sean Winter had like half of his stack, and he bet Timex right during that thing where he like he cashed in like a million for twelve five. Or something he bet like do, do you remember the story where he was at the cage and timex was paying him out and like he won an extra 900k or something i think when he was booking do you i it? i mean i remember i didn't remember that specific thing i do remember the days and the stories like of playing because i was just coming up then and thought it was absurd that people were doing that with timex yeah um yeah, yeah i do i do remember that tournament i was also friends with uh greggy at the time and he got he was deep too yep Yep. Yeah, that was fun. That that was the that was the sweet. Now they got these twenty five k's yearly, right? Where there's five hundred entries or crazy stuff yeah. like the one in uh, GG just did in the Bahamas, where that was that was sweet. It was like a thirteen million dollar prize pool, pretty pretty crazy. And there's been some other big ones as well. But yeah, looking looking here at Cezik, you have some good success. You have a couple hundred k scores, and then talking about this Aussie million, I remember watching this on TV. I believe this is the one where the amateur is this the guy that had no, he played his first ever tournament or something and then you got a heads up and it was a massive score but or maybe it's a different guy yeah. see. it is oh yeah this guy no, it yeah. Is. It, yeah it is what was what was that like i mean because this guy let's see if he's even played oh looks like he has gone on to become uh yeah it was his first ever literally i think his first tournament not even first cash but this guy i mean an absolutely ridiculous story so he's played a bit now but nothing really you can see he still never had a, a six figure score and then that was a seven figure that's probably one of the wilder stories in poker that that is actually how that went down tell me what that experience was like and is it kind of crazy thinking about how good you are how experienced you are just maybe a bit of a, a show how variance works right like you're probably going to beat him most of the time uh i don't know how deep that was or maybe you had a lot of chips when you guys went heads up but tell me about that tournament and this uh this 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 heads up match uh yeah i mean the tournament was absurd it's like already i i can't remember exactly it was 2017 i think i went straight from uh i think i went from pca maybe you can see on the did i have yeah. pca Japan? yeah literally Before days that. later yeah Mm -hmm. so i think it was something like yeah i got i played that 10k the super turbo thing in, in bahamas on the 14th and then i think i left on the 15th uh you know and then you get there so, and it's just such a long journey it's just going from like bahamas to la flying all the way around the world yep uh really jet lagged and then just like get there and entering straight away and then suddenly playing this kind of I think it was six or seven days long um mm. and at the time they actually had they had this thing where it was like I can't remember it was whether it was uh like six or seven total days but after the final day you had a day off before the final table after this like penultimate day okay. and I remember that being just even worse than no days off because I was just like so stressed out about the final table and just so much kind of anxious and excitement that it didn't even feel like a rest day i still just got like three or four hours sleep 
Wow. And then was just like wandering around Melbourne. So I remember being incredibly tired, like going into the final table. And, and, uh, what, and what was what was your stack like? Do you remember? Like, were you middle of the pack? Were you short? Where were you when you started that final table? I was in second behind that guy. He, he had oh, like wow. a massive chip lead, I think. Um, okay. Because I, I remember at the time, like my, I think my equity, like my personal equity in the stack, because, you know, at the time, it was kind of the we had the approach of take have like a reasonable bankroll management approach for a lot of normal mm -hmm. tournaments and then i would just shot take every main at every stop mm -hmm. it, was, it just was like why not like they can't go that badly a lot of them were freeze outs or single re-entry it's just like yeah just fire in these and yeah. see what happens so uh yeah that i think was a big thing for me in terms of the amount of uh my, like net worth at the time that was in my final table stack was like kind of outrageous well it, it it says unknown player in third from germany so i'm not sure if if you knew who that was or if that's just like i guess they're off the hen and mob now or whatever but um did, do you remember who that was by any chance can you, can you show me the yeah just says unknown yeah i um trying to think who it... either way i mean uh, the, the guys here like corey aldemar obviously won the main mustafa connect great player seth davies great player so like these guys go out i don't recognize these guys like local australians this guy i've heard jeff ross i know good player obviously this guy's an yeah. unknown never played before has a chip lead in fedor world class one of the best is there but you know how, how did you feel at that final table like was it because this is a big score you've had i see some 100k right 140 120 100 whatever this is a million 1.2 to first what were how, how was this in terms of a moment for you i mean you real recognize the opportunity right this is a big chance because especially it's not 100k or 25k or 250k the, the amount of buy-ins and the the uh the opportunity here is massive and you said you were a bit stressed out i mean just realizing these don't come all the time these opportunities I think just stressed out, not even through anything, not about anything specific, like mentally thinking, oh, this is a lot of money. Just stressed out because I think your your body is just it's like a lot of adrenaline. <laughs> yeah. In six or seven days. Yeah. That, that is a stuff. tough jet lag too, to, to literally fly in, yeah. go right into it, now play six days. And yeah, exactly. Now it's like, all right, it's a million point two up top from a 10K buy-in and I'm exhausted. But you kind of just like, yeah, dig in one more day and and get through it well tell me about the heads up match what was how many big blinds was it about when you guys started do, do you remember like how was it did he have a huge lead or was it close he had he had quite a big lead i think and i don't think it was that long um i think i can't i'm trying to remember the exact like i we didn't play for that long heads up uh there was actually there was a hand that doug went over on his youtube i think at one point where i basically just like bluffed it off quite early in the heads up match i think i i can't remember exactly i might be wrong but i think i had like three to three or four to one chip deficit going into okay. the heads up um and then i think that that hand was like quite soon in the final table and was for everything and yeah uh, like quite soon into the heads up. looking back what you know now and the player you are now and obviously this is a long time ago and you obviously a great player then even to, to do this and to be to kind of have these type of results you're already winning some tournaments would you have approached the strategy different with this player and there's no deal making at this stage or was it, i mean because it's it's a huge first and second but this is like 450k it's 45 buy-ins and this guy's never played a live tournament he must have been freaking out right he must have been having the time of his life i think it was yeah i think it was actually 60 buy-ins i think because i think it was 10 aussie dollars oh okay okay so it wow. was like it, it was a massive yeah um like in australian dollars it was like 1 right. million for second and 1.6 for first so it's like you know these big like 60 percent pay jumps you're right yeah 60 but, binds yep yeah it's I crazy think, these payouts are wild this is old school payouts they don't do it quite like this but this is like ridiculous spread so like I mean, yeah. what, what, what was it? What was that? Well, like, was he friendly? Were you guys talking? Was he just like in a like? Was he like just having the time of his life, or was he kind of like serious? I forget. I feel like this guy. I remember this vaguely watching some of this. He just seemed like a happy-go-lucky guy that was having the time of his life. Maybe I'm mistaken. But was it like? Was he trying to talk the whole time and have fun, or was he like playing like really intensely? He, he was playing like pretty serious. Like he was trying to play well. Uh, I, I I think there was a difference in like when 
because I played with him quite a lot on day, you know, like the two penultimate days before the final table. Um, and he was playing a lot more like aggro slashy. Um, yeah. Just like, you know, enjoying himself, kind of trying to own people. And I do remember there being like a slight shift when we got to the final table and thinking that maybe like in his day off, he was like, oh, actually, this is a lot. And I have the chip lead. Like, I just yeah. need to get top three. Um, so I think he, but then once we got to the final two, I think it went back a little in terms of, I, we didn't even talk about a deal. You were allowed to, but I think I was kind of thinking, well, it's already an insane score for me and he's not a professional. I don't really want to do a deal like for even. Right. Or like, a, you know, a chip value. And he didn't offer anything or talk about it and i don't think he would have really wanted to either because he's like well i've already locked up an insane amount of money that's like life-changing for me you know at the time you're just like oh we can just gamble for the rest maybe in a few weeks yeah. you would look back and think oh actually that was i would never just sit down at 450k heads up match but he yeah. also had a huge lead i think and like the final table had gone very well for him where he just kept his lead throughout the whole thing um yeah. and then was going in with a big lead and i think a lot of people just don't want to deal then yeah, but, uh, yeah. No, that, that's, that's cool though. That was that's got to be. I mean, that had it was that the most fun at the time, right? It's such a big score. It's televised. It's production. It's in Australia, like where your friends, family, everyone's going. I mean, this is this was your largest score by far, right? One hundred forty k live was biggest yeah. online. Maybe you have some decent wins and stuff, but this was a big moment. How did this? How did this change your trajectory, your career? And and what, after this happened, what was sort of? Um, how did you? Did you sort of recalibrate your bankroll? Did, did this sort of like give you a new uh, a new stratosphere of opportunity that you thought about and and start playing like higher buy-ins or were you still sort of you know just just taking it easy and, and not getting too crazy like what, what was this moment for you what did this do for you in your career uh, I think it was like nice security wise in terms of I put some of the money away into stuff outside of poker um but I did also then start to like gradually try and play higher which was the aim all along you know i think these things are while those scores are very big and mean a lot of the time um you're still kind of looking at it from a long-term point of view in terms of if you do really well at poker you would hopefully get to a point where you know you're um you're like earning enough to put money away from poker every year and yeah. that score hopefully will you know not be the only score you have so and that was like the long-term view for me so I think I still remember being quite focused on moving up quickly and that mm -hmm. made it a little easier too and it was also nice to actually have some kind of savings outside of poker for the first time because it, you know until then I'd just been kind of fully putting my role into you know, just regularly losing kind of 20 to 60% of my role at uh, single stops. Right. Um, so it was like really gambling at the beginning. So it's quite nice to not have to do that and be able to put something out of poker. But I don't think it changed the trajectory too much because I think before that I was already trying to play some of the higher stuff. So it made it a little easier because it just makes it like selling action and stuff a little easier. Um, right. You know, when people, when you're like slightly better known, and, but, uh, but yeah, it was kind of just still on the same path, I think. Do you ever sell on any of the sites? Like, have you used Stake Kings or anything? Or like a put up action? I mean, I'm sure now it's, it's super easy. You have your own kind of crew and sell action if you need to in, in big events. But do you, do you do any of that? Or do you mostly just do within friends and swaps and stuff if you ever do trade action or sell? I think I tried to once, but uh, I, I'm always a little unsure in terms of for the... I think there's a lot of high roller games where you know you're not making that much mm -hmm. and even if you're doing well and say you're making 10 percent, and you want to split that with the investor and charge five percent you know i haven't looked for a while but originally when i was when i was kind of offered by a site i can't remember who at the time um to be on it they were taking like a five percent fee or something from the investor yeah. so i'm like well if i'm selling at five percent and you're taking five from them they're not making anything which didn't feel right yeah it's tough then, to, you know, then you have to disclose like oh this is just for fun you're not actually making anything right uh, yeah that, that's 
that's a tougher conversation. Also, like, so you seem you are a bit. You've been quieter in general, right? You're not. You wouldn't consider yourself like a super out. You're not on social media much. You you post very little on Twitter, or disc, or on um, Instagram. You're not like actively posting or doing a ton there. So it's like not really about you know. It, it's also more complicated to deal with more people. So I'm sure, like you said, you have a couple. You have a tight group. You know, if you ever need to sell, you have people that are willing to buy and easy to buy. So it's got to be that's nice, right? Simple. You don't have to like deal with a lot of people and. And, and, and it's just straightforward. I'm sure now you, uh, you probably just keep taking more and more action as you have just been vacuuming out the money in poker. You've been on quite a, quite a heater. And I do want to talk about 2019. You get this year, you sort of break out. It feels like I'm looking at your stuff, you know, you come in the year, get a nice score, fourth place in a, in a 50 K it's a decent return. And then all of a sudden you win this 50 K at the world series versus lucky chewy and a very tough final table household names across the board there what what was that like to take this down in your first first bracelet yeah i mean i remember the so the end of 2018 was not going very well um i ended up losing a bunch playing very frequently and just like playing slightly higher and the higher end of the buy-ins didn't go that well which is kind of natural you know at the time it can you don't know you can feel like oh i'm moving up and it's tough but you know it can also just be it's 20 tournaments and you, you just don't really know so there's that uncertainty there yeah but yeah i wasn't confident enough at all to be like oh no it's just variant so it's just like maybe i'm just not good enough to play this yeah so i think i think you could actually see on the on the hendon i didn't play from like february to I didn't play off the PCA until um, Monaco, I guess. Um, yeah, just, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. In 2019 mm -hmm. there. Yeah. So, so I think like, I played PCA, came home, and then I just didn't play any live poker until Monaco. Um, and at this point was when we had solvers, but was still quite recent. And I kind of spent, I would say, two and a half months at home, just like uh, cycling, having a kind of, I think I really barely played online at all and just studying for those two and a half months. So it felt very good in terms of, again, it's just, you know, it's not like it's directly related. And obviously there's just a huge amount of variance coming back and having those results, but it felt yeah. good at the time in terms of to be down swinging, take a break, have like two and a half months of just solid study. I would think I was just doing like six days a week studying and then at home um, and not really playing uh when you know obviously you'd like rather be playing a lot sometimes yeah um, yeah so yeah it, it was quite nice to come back and then just like run absurdly well straight off that yeah and then get the get the break and how about playing chewy heads up for a bracelet what was that like because a huge score 1.4 million big big difference for a second of course to get the bracelet get that off your you know off the back to just get that cleared up how how was that final table and how did that heads up go uh the yeah, again, same same thing. I think that um, whenever I look back at those results compared to, like, I think I've got a lot better at it now. But I remember at the time as well, that was a four-day tournament, I think. And I remember just not sleeping well before the final. Mm -hmm. um, and the final went, I think it was like, I think I went in as chip leader, but narrowly. And then I just got in like quite a big flip against nick petrangelo early on um and then and then there was like the absurd thing with sovereign i don't know if you remember that kind of uh, kind of i remember the, something about a world series was, race but, yeah it was like i i it was like uh sovereign opens cut off yourself shoves the button and i'm tanking in the big blind and I throw out a time extension where at the time they look like they were like cards, like plaques. Okay. And several folds, thinking I've folded. Um, oh, yeah, I do. I do remember this vaguely. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you end up calling. I ended up calling. Um, so that was like an absurd hand. It was quite stressful, obviously, because. Uh, you you don't really know what's happened where you're it, it, you know it's just like there's a lot of money there's a lot of money Eurosolve is obviously fuming and kind of 
really unlucky spot for him. Um, what, what, what was your hand? What was like a marginal hand you would have folded if he was behind, basically? Most likely it was like a, you had a close spot. Well, I, I mean, I had used the time bank, so I wasn't really in. I, I was like in this middle bit. It, it was four-handed where it goes like cut-up opens. He shoved for like 19 on the button. I had ace-queen suited in the big. Oh, okay. I can't remember the exact stack distribution. So right. it was like very – I mean, I probably wasn't folding, but uh, right. it was right. – it's pretty close. Um, what what was his hand? Like, what do you have, like sixes or something? Or? Yeah, he's ten off, I think. Okay. All so right. it was like, yeah. Um, yeah. So we had, we had that, which is obviously hugely stressful, and you can't you can't even like process very well when you're that tired and trying to think about the game. You're just like, I don't know what just happened. Uh, and then, and then he was out, and then Sovereign lasted like, I think I bust Sovereign a few hands later, and then Chewy and I, the heads up, lasted like four hands or something, like not four, maybe like ten hands. Wow. Um, and I'm friends with Chewy, so it's like kind of, uh, yeah, that like bittersweet thing. It's like yeah. nice to, nice to play with friends, but you could, you know, you feel bad as well. I know that, like, yeah, you know what it's like to be on the other end of it. So you don't want yeah. to be there. Still, like, still a lot of money. Everyone's pretty happy. And yeah, yeah, pretty happy, pretty happy result. But of course, that is the weird thing about tournaments. And to, in general, it's like, yeah, there's only one actual winner, even though a lot of times top three or four, even a final table feels feels good. But it's one of those things. I don't want to spend the whole podcast on poker and like your specific events, but there are some pretty cool moments here. And you, you know, running up really and coming a little later. You're not like from 2003 or four, right? Starting poker, you came on later. You've had a lot of success recently. And then there's also, I just want to cover one event here at the, the Triton where you, you know, this is big money, three million up top. I remember actually, I believe I was commentating on this one in London. This is during the one million one drop, and they had the hundred K as well, the main event where you got third. Pretty crazy. Why King Young almost went back to back winning the main uh, short deck, and yeah. and uh, I think he got second and first. He and versus uh, Bonomo, and he was actually all in twice to win it. But anyway, pretty cool. Paul Foy, Paul Foy, great. You know, the the creator, one of the founders of Triton getting battling there and, and and big money here and a 1.6 million score and in the UK, right? Friends, family, people are, you know, available around. What was that like to play in Triton with such an amazing production and, and hit this score and be there and your kind of home turf? What, what was that experience like? Yeah. I mean, it was very nice. It's really close to where I came up playing cash. Like the casino I first started playing live cash gym was kind of a 10, 15 minute walk from that casino. Yeah um so nice to be back and you know obviously feel a bit more comfortable just being in home country where you know i know the city well um mm -hmm. and that was like you know just starting to play triton so i hadn't really had that experience as well where such a just like such a nicely run event yeah. um yeah it was like a very exciting main if i mean those mains are quite nice as well because they a little quicker i guess you don't have this like hugely tiring thing but being six days you know the main was two or three days um but yeah that that was i remember that event it was a lot of fun and and what's it like to play 100k or 250k these type of buy-ins and i think have you played the million you you did play the million or you have you played you played the 200k i know of multiple times and 250s have, what's the biggest buy-in you played uh i guess i think 250 so it was it was going to be my first million this like a few weeks ago in yeah for the one drop uh and then ended up not being able to play because of the main event run oh okay um, oh yeah so that's so, uh that's another one I again I, yeah we got you got you got a lot of scores we can't go through them all that's for sure that would be the whole podcast just talking about final tables and, and heads up but yeah the triton give me a little bit of your thoughts on triton and in this year there's four stops and it, uh, do you go to everyone? Is that ones you just won't miss? And do you just enjoy those? Uh, tell me about the Triton experience and, and what you think of that. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, for me, it's just my favorite poker experience. The yeah. way the way they do it is just really good. Um, like, every, you know, everything is, is very good. Um, and yeah, I, I just don't miss them. Uh, there's four this year. We don't know, you know, exactly where they're all going to be yet. But the I booked my hotel and flights, you know, yep. like two or three days ago for for Jeju in March, um, which I'm excited because that was one of the kind of original ones that you know I've heard people. That's one they've done a couple of times before, um, and I think in 2021 maybe or 2020, I 
booked to go. And then with all the COVID stuff, like we had, you know, kind of going back and forth of these trips being cancelled. Um, so I've still never been. Um, so yeah, I go to that one and then pretty much just, uh, I mean, yeah, the only tough thing is that I, I don't miss them, but they do release their schedule quite late as I'm sure you, you know, you know, you come to them. We don't always know where we're going up until, so it makes like planning the year a little trickier, yep. um, than it used to be like, you know, EBT schedules are out. Like, you know, where you're going in January for like that December, um, but but yeah, I, I just don't miss them. They're just like, um, the games are good. The games are big. The games are a lot of fun. Yeah. And they're like really nice schedules in terms of they're mostly playing from between 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. start, depending on the game and the, you know, whether it's day one or two. Mm -hmm. And then you're often kind of playing till 11 to 1, 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. So just in that sense as well, they're just not a very brutal trip. It's not like World Series where you're just getting kind of ground down by these like 11 a.m. start, but you might play till 2 a.m. And then um, so, yeah, I just they're kind of one of the those, I guess, along with like EBT Monaco are the ones I don't really miss. Yeah, makes 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 exact perfect sense. I mean, those are, I think, again, not the. That's that's one of the stops you just don't want to miss. They really do do a great job, Andy and Paul and everyone there. They really, Kate. They they're so hospitable. They do they they really do think of all the details and make it really enjoyable to go. Huge uh, huge, huge train advocate. And what about PLO? I see you do have some PLO results. Do you are you playing PLO now? Do you play any mixed games? Do you play short deck? Any other games or? Um, uh, I don't. I mean, I've played PLO kind of for fun over the years a little. Um, I I really like it. Um, not not I, at the moment. Yeah. At the moment, yeah. I'm just like so much focus on Hold'em, and then you know have a couple of things. I you know hobbies and stuff outside of poker, and I just don't feel like I have the time to. Um, I, I'm quite competitive i guess so i feel like if i wanted to play plo i would want to get really good at it i just don't feel like i have the time for that so i've played some you know i've played a few events over the years but nothing nothing too much and not playing short deck either which is a shame now i mean it never used to bother me that much like world series there's a bunch of mixed stuff but there's so much hold them it doesn't matter now it's always a little a little kind of sad to have to leave you know the tritons do this three or four days at the end off the hold'em is the yeah. other games like yeah. so it's always a bit sad to be leaving when other people are still playing poker um but uh no not really any plans to to change that for now for sure yeah it's enough hold them hold them's an intricate enough game right always learning and still still a lot to do and everyone's so tough and here another again we'll just kind of zoom through a couple of scores this was a big one 2 million 3.2 million adrian mateos also been on the pod, also world class player, and a guy that is definitely solidified as one of the greats in the game. What anything stand out from that? I mean, 33 entries. Do you prefer the 33, 20, 30, 40 person fields, high stakes, high buy in, or do you like kind of the main event, uh, 10K, you know, 500, 1,000 runner type fields? You've had tremendous success in both. Which one would you prefer? And would you say, like, if you had to choose? I generally prefer these, like, the high stuff um these days um i think i'm not actually playing you know that many tournaments a year right now or traveling that much of the year yeah. um yeah. and a lot of doing you know a lot of studying and time off and i like to play the higher stuff and also i guess these days is i'm close friends and you know kind of from close friends and then good friends and you know even just like a lot of acquaintances and that i enjoy spending time with and i don't socialize with a lot of these people outside poker because we all live in different places so yeah. i really yeah. like that aspect of like when i go to a triton you, you have a lot of you know you're not always playing when you're playing live poker right and most most of the time you're just folding and it's actually quite a nice time to be able to kind of catch up with some of the people you haven't seen and yeah socialize a bit when sometimes i can be not very social when i'm at home mm -hmm. um so and that's something that you kind of lose in the main sometimes because sometimes you sit in a main and you're like oh i don't know anyone at my table and i'm quite shy so i'm just like okay i just don't 
talk, I guess, like I, just, yeah. I have my head for everything. So <laughs> I think both of those aspects now ended up just, uh, you know, kind of enjoying these small 50 person fields. Right. And and do you, would you say you're recognized amongst the community now when you go play these 5K, 10K main events, like at the win, you just have this ridiculous run in one of the record setting fields in, in, a, in a 10K and you get what, fifth or sixth or I forget you, what, what place did you get? The final, the fifth, win just fifth. Or so fifth, when you're there and you're in it and you're on day one, day two in these huge fields, are you, do people, do you, do, do you feel they recognize you? Do they come say something to you? Do you, do, are you kind of, um, because again, you're not very prevalent on social media, but you have maybe one of the more impressive resumes in the game now with over 20 million in lifetime earnings, basically number two on the, the UK all-time money list. I think just basically tied with Trickett, who hasn't really been playing tournaments, right? But do, do you feel that people, res- that obviously the, the, the top professionals know you and respect you, but do you feel respect and are people recognizing you that are you know in, in just kind of a random field? Do you, do you could get come up to and talk to? Okay. Um. I come up to us do a huge amount sometimes it was definitely more after the the most i've ever had it was just after that bracelet win because mm. the bracelets people like especially americans just care so much about the bracelets yeah and like the few days after that and the rest of that series was the most i've had of that right um but it's been gradually like gradually more and more these days you know like sometimes rarely off the poker table too just in like you know couple of times in brighton and other places yeah but, I would, uh, i'd say what about brighton you're at a pub you're out there at a gro- at the grocery store around like are people coming up to you are they know is it like are they do they kind of know of you in poker has that become a thing where you say you'd be I, I, think it's, I think it's very like not very common maybe it's happened like seven to eight times total um, right of poker and then I, I think like in the poker like when you're saying in these mains it's hard to t- tell because a lot of people don't say anything but i right. think these days the what's happened is that the tritons are all streamed cards up and they're a very good place for learning because you get mm-hmm. to watch high stakes players playing their actual strategy without holding anything back because they mm-hmm. can't really hold anything back because it's such high stakes so i think that what's happening now is a lot of people who are trying to improve at poker are watching the tritons so i think like i notice it's a little more these days just because i think even if people don't um, don't follow poker or follow social media it doesn't need me posting on instagram for them to just be aware that like you know if they watch the triton streams yeah the triton are streaming day ones day twos it's not just final so you're kind of always on these triton streams because they they stream every day two and you're in a day you're in the day twos like 30 percent of the time you make it to the day two and you know there's like 12 days so you're actually on stream quite often so i, I think it's like a little more since then you know that people are involved um certainly pros i think kind of recognize a lot of the triton players more right um and, and what t- tell me about downswings or high stakes and again it's tricky right because the hen and mob oh you've won 21 million but how much is buy-ins right these type of conversations because there are stretches although you do have a lot of results but there's definitely you know here even alone like oh 50 60 200 250 125 60 what do yeah you, i got you, i got completely like i that trip was quite tough the london one because i got i had like the if you look at the bottom there was like the first events uh i i think i was i had like chip lead or close to it um in those in those two first events and got like 12th and 12th mm-hmm. and you can really feel it like i'd already been down swinging a bit before that and you can feel it in those things where there's just so much variance where you can have 10x starting stack and think okay i've built up like in this 40k i've built up 400k of equity getting 10x starting stack but suddenly it's only 40 bigs and now like you could have won 10 flips or you know however you could just like been running well all day yeah. and then suddenly you have 40 bigs you lose one and like oh you now got one buy in back and they're pretty stressful because you can just feel how you know I, i've like seen a lot of simulations for the variance of these things and it's really crazy how i think a lot of people don't know how you can just even if you're a top reg in these games you can just get crushed for a while that's like per- especially if you're not playing a huge volume so it's definitely stressful when you're down swinging because there's none of that like you know if you're playing online cash and you're down swinging but you are very confident in your, your game 
you can fall back on this thing of like it's going to turn around whereas in these games you can't as much like you might just get crushed for like three or four years and you just have to take it so it's right. definitely and like you said like the buy-ins you know i've had that sometimes where people have come up to me and said oh like you know congrats it looks like you've had a crazy six months and i'm like i'm down a lot in the last six months like you you know you have to be cashing these things regularly for a large amount because the tritons you're just in for like 800k or every trip so you know you have i think that happened to me in cyprus where i came second in a 50k for 500 or something in one of the tritons mm -hmm. and someone like congratulated me on the trip after and i was like i lost a bunch i was in for like 850 and i cashed one for 500 it's like you have yeah. to be regularly getting those top three otherwise you're just losing yeah, it's it is it is intense. I think that is also one of the, the, the problems, or well, I shouldn't say a problem, but the misconceptions that people don't really understand. Or it's also especially when there's rebuys and these big buy, buy in ten minutes, you see a score and it's like not necessarily yes. uh, intuitive, like how much you're in. So that is interesting. Do you did you ever since you really broke out? Let's call it 2017, 16. Was there ever a period where you were like, wow, I may actually stop, or I, this is too crazy? And have you had some mental different difficult times that you've had to work through, or has it been pretty smooth for the, for the majority since you got? you know acclimated to the top high stakes um, i would say not looking to stop that period i spoke about before at the end of 2018 was tough yeah. and i you know kind of made me take a few months to just go and study um i think i was you know it wasn't anything ridiculous it was like i lost 40 buy-ins but you know in live tournaments and still playing i wasn't playing like the super small fields so it's kind of like completely normal but when you're suddenly playing way higher buy-ins than you're used to you're like oh that's quite a lot of money and yeah so that was a, like a tougher time and then yeah the last few years have just been insanely swingy um to be honest like these these games like you said that a lot of this stuff is unlimited re-entry for the tritons yeah and the game is really good so you also kind of feel incentivized to gamble um and yeah there's there's been some like you know very swingy times but nothing that's generally kind of just made you know when these downswings happen i'm like okay just like keep playing and study hard and hope it turns around but if it doesn't turn around like that's kind of what you signed up for nothing that really makes me want to quit it's you know you know there's a chance that you just get crushed that's for what you sure. sign up for when you yeah. play like high variance live tournaments and low volume. So, yeah, you know, it's a bit like sad at times, but not, oh, I'm going to stop playing. How, how do you say, how would you understand or explain to someone about variance? Because, you know, my wife's Brazilian and I love her to death and she's she's amazing. But like if I come home and I bust with Kings to ace deuce off and, and for a big pot, she doesn't care. You know, it's all about results, right? Like how do you how do you? How do you sort of understand results with like, how would you, I guess, I don't know how to explain what I'm saying, you know, to results oriented is such a thing, right? But for someone who you said you could play on a, you could be a great player and play live and not have success for years. Cause like online, right. You get to play so much more volume, but, uh, but live yeah. there's just like, you don't get to get that volume in. Like how, how would you have a way for someone to be honest with themselves and to really understand if they're running well or, or not? And, especially live because that is a difficult thing to understand like how your how the variance is really happening you know, online you can see charts and graphs and plug in hands and there's some so so systems to kind of give you an idea but like live it doesn't really work that way right you just kind of know if you're running bad or not but how would you say to someone yeah, to, be I mean, to understand that i think it's very hard I, I think one of the kind of important things to do that a lot of people haven't done is there are just variance calculators you can like plug in the field size the payout structure and your expected roi that you're kind of estimating you have and then mm -hmm. you can it will just run a bunch of outcomes to show you how likely it is that you you know win or lose in a five-year period um and i think taking a look at some of those is useful for most people because from people i've spoken to a lot of people like the variance is crazy even with these small fields you know the like thousand person fields are just absurd mm -hmm. and i've spoken to people who do it full time who you know even though they do it and kind of roughly know the numbers a lot of people still just really underestimate the variance of these things um so i think looking at those for poker players is good and then i think if you're not in poker it's like it can be quite hard to yeah really like wrap your head around the oh but you know you're good but you're losing 
Um, mm. But I honestly, like, I don't speak that much about the results with people outside of poker. Right. Um, especially since the games got bigger. Uh, I think it's, like, not that helpful for me always and kind of yeah. stressful for people, like, people that you're <laughs> yeah. close to that you'd be comfortable talking to. Like, I don't right. want to it can be stressful to just suddenly be like oh i lost 30 buy-ins you know these games um so i'm kind of typically i guess when i when i want to go to someone to talk about is this variance or not it's typically just like someone else in the games right um makes, who, who makes perfect it. sense makes perfect perfect sense i agree completely it's also kind of a different world right to talk someone's working nine to five or typically just in general like if they don't even have any poker acumen it's sort of difficult to, to really yeah they, they it's like a it's like a dream world it's not even real real life you're telling me you're gonna put like your salary on the line for a year or two on one tournament or whatever it's it's just kind of it's kind of crazy um and your wife i gotta ask you met her in barcelona is that correct where did you meet her there yeah uh yeah uh incredibly lucky like i usually just play these trips just like straight through Mm -hmm. And I kind of like torched off a 25k there, one of the single days, just like terrible hand, was really not happy and not feeling like playing the next day and was just like, okay, I was living with, I had an apartment with Sam Grafton at the time for that trip. And was just like, yeah, you want to, you want to go out and get a drink? Like I do not, I'm not playing tomorrow. I'm just going to like go and, you know have some fun, have a few drinks and just relax and try and forget about this hand. And uh, Joe Stapleton was coming to meet us. Um, he's like, you know, friends with Sam. Mm -hmm. And his friend, one of his close friends from LA is uh, a um, producer in LA. And she, her best friend is my wife. And they were coming to see Joe because they were in Barcelona for like two days. And um, Joe said he was going to be at this bar. And then so I I met her. I um, ended up actually like leaving because I think I, there was still like three or four. I was going to have one day off and then carry on playing. And then uh, I met my wife in this bar and she was like leaving Barcelona the next day. And we kind of hit it off and I was like well if I you know if she goes like that's just like these things always just they like fizzle out it's hard when you're traveling you're in different places yeah so uh I ended up just like leaving with her um and just not playing the rest of the stop so end up being very fortunate because uh, you know if I just kind of played that hand well I would just never go out drinking on these trips I'm just I think that was one of the first times I'd done that in years so wow. quite fortunate that's crazy. So yeah, I mean that that I, I met my wife at Burning Man, walking by in the middle of the uh, the desert as well, with no mutual contacts, friends, and also our first time there. Do you, do you think about? Do you think that poker has allowed you to understand or process life better about variance and 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 fortune? Because you know, in poker, we we get these examples so quickly: the bat, ace king, the ace queen losing, or hitting a two outer, or the example you just gave. You know, to to be able to understand kind of the bigger picture in life that do you feel there's a lot of things that you take away from poker that, that allow you to sort of process life in a different way or in a better way? Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of small things and probably a lot of things that I don't even know about, but the, the one that I really notice is not being annoyed at small things, I guess, just mm -hmm. like seeing small things like bad beats where before poker, having something like my laptop breaking would be really stress well, obviously it's more stress you know at the time because i'm comparing it to before poker which was when i was a student and then like the monetary cost of that was way more stressful but i also just had the like emotional response of kind of why why me like why today why me like why does my laptop have to break just that like general you know annoyed at something bad happening whereas these days i think with all the you know you're so used to these things in poker where it's not like why you it's just like that's just how variance works it's sometimes you and sometimes it's someone else yeah and having that in life of just like something bad happening and just being like oh i guess this is my turn for the bad thing like you can't do anything about it it's you right. just like carry on going uh that's helped me in terms of uh i don't have yeah i guess not just these like random things that can really affect my mood negatively or way less than before i think 
And, and it looks like you do post a lot of some travel where you, you know, you've been around, you look at some, some really nice pictures, almost look like professional photography. Is that a hobby of yours or, and, and, and also do you get to, when you travel the world, do you get them, do you get to see the cities you're visiting? Uh, and, and does your wife travel with you and does she enjoy the poker and the stops? That's kind of a lot. My dad actually had a couple of questions. He was, he does notes. He was asking about the travel stuff. And if you kind of get to enjoy when you go, have you, have you made it a point to, to, to stop and, and spend some time in places? Cause a lot of the same stops though, right? That's the thing. It's a lot of the same stops every year, but do you do a good job? Do you get to see the places you go? Yeah. I mean, I, I used to kind of make it more of a point to, to do little trips nearby after. So, you know, I think Bahamas, like after Bahamas, I went to Miami, New York, LA, different like each year would just kind of pick an american place i hadn't seen and go to and go there for a few days after so do it that way rather than because like you said you're always in the same places um you know i would kind of add trips on um and then a lot of this stuff was i had a i think you know a lot of the kind of landscape photos uh i was taking a lot doing a lot more photography um in the past i, I would still like to i still love it um, been ha I just had like a little less time from work recently, but was able to use the time a bit. I think I had one time where I had a month or six weeks, something with not much poker. I went on a 10 day road trip around the Alps taking photos. And then from there, just flew straight to Seattle and drove from Seattle down to uh, LA. Um, Very cool. So used to kind of try and fit stuff like that in, um, you know, and like Aussie Millions did... New Zealand after that one year, Australia after that one year. Um, so I, I've tried to make it a point to actually see places, not just like go for the poker and then come back and never, you know, never see outside of the casino. Um, yeah. And yeah, like like Lizzie now comes with me, depending on her work. She can't always, you know, it depends on like both our work schedules. But the same thing, she's not always, she doesn't come that often during the poker. We We do the same thing, like, Triton Monaco this year while everyone else was playing the PLO and short deck that I don't know how to play. She came for those three or four days and we did yeah. one day in France, one day in Monaco and one day in Italy. And like, we try and do, we try and do that where, you know, maybe she can come for a couple of days. It's not that it's not with that fun for her to come, you know, she was coming and I'm just like playing poker 12 hours a day. Right. And, and, and how supportive is she in understanding? Does she know what, does she understand kind of the game now? Does she follow, does she play at all? Or just sort of, uh, just root, just, just good, good. Does she understand flips and variants too? Like, would you say she's pretty, pretty understanding of the whole game? She's, she's learning. Like we're, uh, we're both, you know, it's the same as anything, right? You just don't know, you know, a lot about your own job and not about other industries. Like I'm kind of gradually learning about what she does and she's gradually learning about poker uh yeah i mean she's very supportive it's quite you realize how much there is of like i had 10 years of you gradually desensitize yourself and get like every stake you get like used to playing for the new amounts so when you meet someone and you're already playing high stakes it's quite an adjustment for uh you know for her to she hasn't gone through that learning process right um right so yeah, just uh, the same as as I'm learning about her stuff. She's like gradually learning about poker, but is very, yeah, very supportive of it. That's awesome. And how many years do you think it took you to become a really good player? Do you think that you overestimated your abilities by by a good stretch when you first started playing? Is that kind of in general poker people have an ego? I think it's just sort of typical to think that they're good. Or were you pretty humble and sort of understanding that it was an intricate game that would take time? Uh. I think the I think at the beginning I had progressed quite quickly at the at the smaller stakes and was kind of going through this thing of some confidence because I thought I was progressing quickly, but then you also get shot down a lot because then you're trying to move up stakes um quite aggressively and you keep getting, you know, kind of sent back down to the one below. Um I think the I think the type the main time I probably really overestimated myself was when I start, first started playing the high stuff. Um, I think it's quite easy to be, you know, think you're like, oh, I'm moving up quickly yeah. and yeah. underestimate how much experience and how many different spots and stuff, you know, that these people like Ike have played in their career. Right. 
and that you can't just come in three years in and be that good. And I thought that I was probably doing, I think at the time, there was a time I thought I was meant to be, not meant to be, but like I thought I was passing me in the high rollers of when I first started shot taking them and looking back, I was probably not, but like that's right. the process you go through. It's like you're going to play some losing tournaments sometimes. And I think that's also, you know, the cost of wanting to move up quickly. Right. Um, but there was definitely a time there where looking back now, I'm like, oh, I thought I was obviously not making what I was, but I thought I was like making two to four percent in some of these tournaments. And maybe looking back, I was I was not. Um, right. But in yeah, now I think it's like hard to really like now things seem. I think with like the solvers, it's so clear how hard the game is that it can almost be the other way sometimes that it's i find it a little hard to have a ton of confidence even if you're playing big games and you know i think i'm decent at poker but you just spend so much time with this computer who's just infinitely better than you let, let, let's take the high rollers because i uh, there's there's a lot of players now exactly you're saying when you go look at arthur you know even like your final table here right i mean there's a pretty ridiculous final table yeah, this is a crazy playing. final I mean, literally, like legend, literally legend of the game, UK guy, been around forever, Mormon online, number one all time for so long. L you just mentioned Lucky Chewy, who you were played heads up for the 50K bracelet. Arthur, maybe you could argue, is, you know, he's young and crushing live and online. Um, Gior Georgios, I believe his name is, who did he get second? Or I think he's he's an absolute, you know, he's been around crushing. There's literally everyone here I know, yeah. but and even the guy that won, he ended up winning, I believe, and he was maybe the only unknown or like, not household name that's a crazy final six and that enough how many people were in this tournament like uh what was it i mean like four thousand bullets i think four, four right, thousand like 30, 30, bullets. yeah i mean four thousand or something almost right thirty eight hundred people like that is absolutely out of out of this world that 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 and is the final I mean, six the right. the guy who won it like you said he's the kind of person who was the least known but oh, look at his resume. He, he, was, he was very good. Like he's good at poker. Right. You know, yeah, I mean, it wasn't like he was unknown and a complete amateur. He's like a good poker player. So yeah, I mean, you can see he's played a lot, a lot of events. Like a lot. Wow. This is actually crazy volume. This must be online, some of this, right? Yeah, some of these are online events, but yes, the online um, world series stuff is crazy. But online, online, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's yeah. almost not promising for poker. I mean, that, I I go back and forth. Where do you, where do you? I I want to ask you a couple more questions here. The state of poker. What do you? What's your instinct tell you online? There's obviously been a lot of chaos. There's some you know a lot going on. Uh, what what do you think about the the state of poker for live and online at this moment? Um, I, I guess I wouldn't want to comment too much on online because I just don't feel like I'm in that right area right now. Um, you know, I was kind of gradually moving away from it. I played a little during COVID and we had some issues with those high stakes games at the time. Um, and that was like pretty much the last time I played re serious volume because I lost quite a bit in those games. And then also found out there was some, you know, dicey stuff happening and it yeah. doesn't leave a, doesn't leave a great feeling. So, you know, online, I think I still have a lot of friends that play online. I know it's like still possible to be a pro. There's also a lot of crazy stuff happening. Uh, yeah. I guess it's like, I'm not really sure about the future of that. I would hope that the, you know, as the ways to take advantage of stuff progress, I would hope that the security of the sites also progress and that we can like keep it, you know, as a method of playing that's fine. Live poker, I feel good about like, it's, I mean, it's insane right now, right? We got record breaking fields in Prague for EBT for the main event. Then this like huge World Series event in Bahamas, and then this record-breaking WBT, all basically at the same time. I know that you could do both of you know Bahamas and Vegas, but I didn't even play the main in Bahamas. I chose to play the main. You did actually have to choose a bit some events, so they kind of all three crossed over, and somehow yeah. all three are just record-breaking fields. Like, yeah, uh, I think you know a lot of this stuff with. Um, you know, over the last years, I mean, you've been part of it, right? With like the podcasts, the streaming, like the yeah. GG show, stuff coming in, like, um, you know, we've seen like some very well known chess players and like streamers from other industries come in 
Um, I think a lot of this social stuff and streaming platforms has really helped the game and is helping the game. And I think that poker seems to be, I, I don't think there's issues in my mind for live poker, at least. Um, I think, yeah. you know, the games seem just bigger than ever all the time. So uh, I'm not worried about live poker in terms of like where it's going. Yeah. Also the WSOP plus app, you know, that was in the Bahamas. It's just so convenient. Now you can literally get funds on multiple ways, have a balance, click a button, enter. It gives you your seat at the table. It, it's pretty wild. Like it really is. It's just like, it's made, it's all these things that optimize that help the big blind Annie, the shot clock, these things that are making poker easier, more efficient, saving time being like you mentioned about your lifestyle, right? It's like, trying to find a way where it's like normal scheduling you can go to bed you can do things that are they're making it better and, and they're listening to the players it feels like there is changes across the board uh that are that are better and you know yeah it, it does i feel like the same way i think it's also cool mystery bounties there's newer type of variations kind of kind of making things a little more fun and finding new ways and also obviously there's like five card now six card there's some other variants of poker i don't think it's going anywhere i think the game's stronger than ever people love the mix of luck and skill and and being able to, to to play a game that they love so it's great my last question is game of gold game of gold did you watch it what are your thoughts would you be on it in the future i i watched it like not not like a hundred percent of it but i watched a decent amount of it i think it's uh hard to miss if you're you know, usually I'm just like watching poker replays and kind of watching stuff that's study based. Um, and I'm not, I don't watch a bunch of the like high stakes cash streams or anything, but this seems just like a completely new format that is interesting. I think for most people in the game to see, I, I like to see, just like I was saying, I like to see how all this stuff's progressing with how people are marketing the game and what people are interested in who aren't in, you know, who aren't playing uh like a specific game i guess a lot of people are interested in their own game right like i watch replays of high stakes mtts because that's what i want to watch and i'm interested in that for like the learning purpose of who i play yeah. against but interesting to see these things that are trying to market to everybody in poker not just certain groups and how they're doing it and i was not expecting to watch much to be honest i'm not usually a fan of those things i was kind of expecting to like watch half of the first episode and then yeah. bail on it but i ended up watching like most of it and thought it was actually very well very well done um and yeah i hope it continues uh i i don't know whether i would be on it that generally isn't my i would never want to say no if anyone, yeah. if anyone wants to invite me i would think about it uh yeah. i i don't know what the terms were in terms of like how long you had to be away and right where it was and stuff like that but uh, well, yeah a lot of variables but you're not, you're not out you're not saying you wouldn't it's a no it's just uh it's a consideration if that were to come your way I would think about it, yeah i mean it looks like a fun thing to feel like a fun thing to do uh, a little a little like i'm not usually a fan of being it's one of those things where i think it's good for people who like being in the spotlight there's a lot of times where the camera is just on you right it's not even like playing a final table you have to like go in a separate room and give your thoughts and stuff uh i mean I, I i assume there's a lot of people that relate to it as well but the stuff of like having a team captain and then you having to pick people in yeah. front of them yeah. just makes me anxious just as a person yeah. watching other people have to do that like i would just not want to choose people in order of their probability that is like their profession right in front of them right. it's like i don't enjoy that so there's some stuff like that where i'm like ah maybe not for me but never right. never 100 percent more you know for sure okay well listen ben i i appreciate it. it's been a pleasure i've gotten to know you better i hope everyone at home has had an enjoyment and listening they can follow you again on on more more on instagram twitter you do have but it's not much yeah. posting so instagram people can kind of follow along with your journey and hopefully we'll see more of you in the future and I really do appreciate you coming on the GG Millions, doing the commentary. That's every Tuesday, 145. You were on one of the, I believe it was this, not not this one, the week before. So that was that was fun to get to yeah. pick your brain poker-wise and here got to know more about you as well. And hopefully we'll have you on in the future. I would say next time you have a, you know, a big result, but it seems like every other week you're having a major score, seven figure, six figure, and hopefully that continues for you. And again, all, all I've heard is, 
positive things about you in the community and from mutual friends. So it's good to actually get to talk with you and hope we get to uh, link up. I think I owe you a dinner from the um, from the millions, but actually I can never keep track. So I literally just end up treating every dinner because I, you know, you come on, take the time. So we'll, we'll, we'll have a nice dinner in the future and uh, let me know when you get to Miami and I'm sure we'll cross paths and Jeju and future stops as well for, for poker. So again, appreciate the time. Number three, soon to be number two all-time money list in the UK with 21 million plus earnings in poker. Pretty impressive stuff, especially if you've only been in the game for so long. So I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. And I will, I'll be reaching out and we'll, uh, we'll get together soon off, uh, on a, on a future stop. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. All right, everyone. That is number 194 on the flow show, Ben Heath. UK crusher legend and not stopping anytime soon. Steven Chidwick, the number one all-time money list earner. That's that's big, big, big task to go. He's not slowing down either, but hey, you never know. Uh, you never know, right? Poker, we, there's $20 million available scores for the, for the taking these days, so things can happen quickly, yeah. and, and I know you'll be in the mix in those events. As you said, you missed the $1 million event because you were busy final tabling a 3,800-person uh, event at the same time. So, Hey, anything's possible. We wish you all the best and I will see you again very soon. Thanks again, Ben, for the time. Thank you.